you. Um, we're going to hear from some members of the class now. Uh, as has become some, something of a tradition, uh, the members of the senior class have chosen to add a speaker. Typically, you've got the, the uh, guest speaker, and then you have the valedictorian, the salutatorian. Uh, our students tend to like to uh, have another speaker, and this is just a speaker whom they vote on and uh, decide they'd like to hear from. So um, tonight's uh, extra speaker, if you will, uh, elected speaker is Merrick Bonar. I, yeah. So I have known Merrick since he was about six. First time I met him, he was standing at his mom's side in the driveway. I was talking to her, and I directed a kid question toward him. And he responded about the way he would right now if I were to ask him a kid question. He gave me the mirror book that says basically, I'm not sure why you'd ask me that, but here's your obvious answer. <laughs> I've watched Merrick develop over the years in a lot of ways. It's pretty easy to recognize that his intellect is a defining characteristic, but he's also developed a great sense of humor, which I, I attribute partly to his having to deal with my daughters when we were driving him home on occasion with their randomness and their non sequitur and, uh, and his analytical linear broke him in though and after a while he gave as well as he got. Merrick is a true academic. He loves to learn things. He loves to know things. He's a voracious reader and he loves history especially. He also possesses a deep knowledge of classic rock music. And he's not afraid to step out of character and put on a chiffon skirt for history class or the talent show. <laughs> Please welcome tonight's elected student speaker, Mr. Merrick Bonar. All right, so I'm, I think I'm gonna do something pretty different, but uh, tonight I would like to speak with all of you on a concept that I have liked to call involuntary education. By this, I mean the level of education that a government and society deem necessary for an individual to be successful. I and all of my 55 compatriots stand before you today having just completed that level. For many of us, it is the closest thing to a, uh, an initiation right that we will ever get. But why is this? Why do employers offering quality careers almost always demand high school diplomas? Why would Wisconsin go to the Supreme Court with the Amish, of all people, about whether the Amish could send their kids to trade school at eighth grade rather than attend high school? Why is high school so important? The answer lies with suffrage. The history of suffrage is, in also, many, is also in many ways the history of universal public education. As America began in 1856 with universal white male suffrage and ended in 1965 with the Voting Rights Act, yes, it did take us that long to clean up our act. So too did they begin to mandate that people be educated. Prior to the expansion of voting rights, participation in government was tied most intrinsically to property ownership and thus to wealth and education. America's pseudo-aristocracy was expensively and handsomely educated to a fault. They knew how the Republic functioned. They had read their Locke and their Madison and their Plato and they were intimately familiar with the intellectual foundations that birthed the democratic ethic. They were schooled in logic and rhetoric, and many were successful attorneys in a time in which law was entirely determined by one's argumentative talent. Whatever we might now think of an array of their monstrous behaviors, they weren't idiots. Intensely complex populist systems do not work without a culturally empowered and knowledgeable populace. These societies that attempt general elections without establishing this takes, for instance, revolutionary France or ancient Athens, fall inexorably into bloodshed, collapse, or both. They're unstable and unsustainable, and the upper class knew this. The escape, then, is to raise the everyman to the education level of the rich. The escape, paradoxically, is parody. 
uh, with a T-Y, parity. Starting in the 1850s, states began to pass compulsory education laws. Note that this is the exact same time that they passed universal male suffrage. Mandating that children be sent ever expansively to grammar school and middle school and eventually the first two years of high school. These were aggressively enforced and the state had the right to remove children from families that would not educate them. And the next generation armed with the vote, according to the, those who were establishing the system, could not have the mob mentality and ignorance to be the one to rend society in two over differences in ideology. This is perpetually true. And thus, education is an eternal struggle to ensure that our negligence does not cause our children to destroy us. <laughs> this, and precisely this, is why we have involuntary education. Pre-12th grade education is not intended to give career skills at its foundation. You can go to trade school or university later, if you like, to receive specialized occupational training. But without training in mathematics, history, science, and literature, you lack sufficient cultural context to be a member of society that makes occupational training a boon. These happen to be the why subjects, as in, teacher, why are we learning this? What and when will we ever use this in our lives? Taken literally, as the cynical and lazy teenager means it, they won't. But without them, one cannot differentiate themselves from others and individuals properly. One cannot avoid entanglements with deceitful ideas and their used car salesmen, politicians, and pseudo-intellectuals. I have yet to see anyone structure their lives or values with an electrician's credentials or an engineering degree or a law degree alone. And you just can't do it. One needs context. One needs ethics, taught best by history, by which we see what caused and alleviated the most human suffering. One needs logic, taught principally by mathematics, so as to evaluate problems without leaps that, ma that make the solutions structurally unsound. One needs reason, taught by science, by which we can learn to properly determine the true from the untrue and how to be persuaded by proper rhetorical and demonstrated evidence, civilly, even should it run contrary to deeply held beliefs. Reason is anti-superstition, anti-ignorance by design. Reason is the antidote to the superstition that Voltaire wrote about in that quote all over your programs. One finally needs humanity offered by literature and learning to interact with the struggles of those who lived and suffered before us. It is to acknowledge the genius and viability of others, to learn with their anger and joy, with literature, we acquire wisdom. Of all educational levels, the high school diploma is the only one that, in modern times, has ever sought to simultaneously and equally instill all of these values. To paraphrase the French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau, it is by education that children become adults. It is how boys and girls become truly mature men and women, those capable of affecting change in the world around them responsibly and ethically. The university takes adults and turns them into professionals, but only the high school is so ambitious as to attempt to make the impetuous and make them mature. It is truly something beautiful should it succeed, but as it stands, it rarely does. For my senior project, I studied totalitarian ideologies and the mass murder they inflict upon the societies in which they take root. I did not need to learn about the education in America while I was studying it, but as I was more interested in reading my Marx and Lenin and Derrida, I found some truly astonishing statistics. For instance, the greatest mass murderer in, in all of human history is Mao Zedong, the communist dictator of China who killed 60 million of his own people. 40% of millennials have never even heard of him. One third of millennials think that George Bush killed more people than Joseph Stalin. I'm serious. And for clarity, the difference between the two is a difference of 50,000%. If only one third of them, according to a different statistic, can properly determine and differentiate socialism from communism from fascism, how can we expect them to correctly identify a fascist and vote against him? How can we expect them to correctly morally evaluate communism when only a quarter of Americans can correctly place its death toll at over 100 million in the 20th century? These failings in historical education pose significant dangers, sure, but they're only a microcosm of the greater issues present. Math proficiency, for instance, continues to be abysmal across the entire country, and standardized testing scores show no real improvement over long durations of time in many communities. We are not giving our children the tools they need to survive intellectually in a world that, because they can vote, demands great cognitive responsibility from even the least of them. We do not give them the tools to form systems of values for themselves, and instead they appropriate whatever is in vogue without consideration that it might have come from somewhere. 
why should they start investigating their ideas now when all through high school and all through their childhood, they were never expected to? It will surely create disaster if it is not reverted. But this is very, the very reason why I am proud to have attended the Coeur d'Alene Charter Academy. I have never met a group of students so relentlessly civil, as relentlessly polite, and as relentlessly academically inquisitive as those who sit right before you at this moment. They have had world-class teachers in every subject, who are led by inspired administrators, who draw from a man, though he may not be here tonight, unfortunately, is the closest to a hero that I have ever met, Dr. Bill Crozier. I am so confident that each and every one of these young people have all the cultural and intellectual fortitude to be incredible forces for good in our world, no matter where they choose to go or what they choose to do. The Charter Academy is rare among educational institutions in that it makes adults of, entirely, of entire graduating classes, and not just a few at its upper edge. It is rare in that it ubiquitously fulfills the role of involuntary education for each and every one of its students. I, for one, have been a part of two different charter classes because of my tenure as a foreign exchange student, and I would like to affirm that it is this particular group assembled here at this particular time that is something truly and remarkably special. One day, I will look back tonight and see, that all, the, all, and see all that my friends have done here. And I will be so amazed at what these world beaters in trading will do. I urge everyone here to keep a close eye on these young people because so many of them will achieve pure, glorious greatness in their lifetimes. Just you wait. And none of it would have been possible without the exemplary education received here at Charter. Thank all of you so very much, the teachers, the parents, the administrators, the custodians, all of you. You have no idea how much your support has meant to us all throughout our journeys. Thank you very much, Amen.